morning. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see such a full room today. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Dana Stoff. Uh, Dana Stoff fell in love with cephalopods at the age of 10. Uh, she began to keep them as pets in a home aquarium and learned to scuba dive in order to meet more of them in the wild. She went on to study pygmy octopuses in Santa Barbara, cuttlefish in Australia, reef squid in Bermuda, and finally completed her PhD on, quote, reproduction and early life of the Humboldt squid, or, quote, squid sex and babies at Stanford. Her first book, titled Squid Empire, the Rise and Fall of the C Cephalopods has been named one of the best science books of 2017 by NPR Science Friday. She lives in San Jose in the physical world and at cephalopodiatrist.com online. Please join me in welcoming to Google, Dana Staff. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here. You know, it was probably hard to take time away from your work to come, and I appreciate that everybody was able to do that, to be here. And that for anybody watching it uh, remotely or in the future, thank you for taking time out of whatever else you were going to be doing to see this. Um, I am here to talk to you about cephalopods, which is a difficult word to say all by itself, and so we can just call them squid and octopus and relatives. And in particular, the story that I want to tell about them is a story that parallels the history of dinosaurs. And the reason that this particular story about cephalopods has caught my attention to the point that I wrote a whole book about it is that I started to realize that the, the deep evolutionary history of squid and octopuses was even more fascinating than the famous dinosaurs that we all know and love from the age of three or four. And yet nobody knows anything about it. So I'm going to tell you today why cephalopods are even better than dinosaurs. And in particular, trying to spark something that I like to call the cephalopod renaissance. And this is a reference to something called the dinosaur renaissance um, that happened in the latter part of the last century. Uh, we often don't even realize it today, but dinosaurs used to be seen as really slow and really stupid and really boring. And that was this... Um, this view up here, uh, this drawing was done in the late 1800s, but the view persisted into the, the early 1900s as well, that dinosaurs were too heavy to even walk around, they had to live in swamps, they were too stupid to survive, and so they were already doomed by the time an asteroid hit and ended their reign. Um, and so no one was actually that interested in their lives and behavior until a scientist uh, named Bob Backer in the 60s started to describe dinosaurs, in particular one famous dinosaur named Deinonychus, and realized that it, was, it moved quickly, it was very active, it was very energetic, um, and this actually became the whole view of dinosaurs that we now know as complex creatures with social lives and behaviors and all their relationships with birds and the feathers and the warm-bloodedness and all of this stuff is called the dinosaur renaissance and gives us this beautiful view of the, the delightfully ferocious, warm-blooded, cuddly dinosaurs uh, that we know today. And of course, this dinosaur renaissance happened in the scientific literature, championed by scientists, but it quickly seeped out into popular culture, giving us all of these. Uh, this is why we have Jurassic Park and all of its sequels. This is why we have so many sticker books full of dinosaurs and video games full of dinosaurs. It's because there was this shift in scientific thinking about dinosaurs, real, realizing how complex and interesting their lives really were. And so I'm here to show you the same thing happening with cephalopods, except they're even better. Um, and one of the ways in which they're even better um, is that they have so many representatives around today that we can learn from. Of course, we have representatives of dinosaurs today. We have birds. Um, and similarly to that, we can think about what do we have, the squid and octopus that we have today, and what makes them what they are. Uh, a lot of the things that we think of are tentacles. Um, camouflage, there's actually a cuttlefish here hiding in the sand. Its little arms are coming down there and has two little black eyes. The amazing camouflage abilities of these animals are legendary. And of course, they can also squirt ink if that doesn't work and they have to get away quickly. And it's 
all connected to their intelligence, their very large brains, their ability to coordinate the camouflage, the behavior, to coordinate all of those arms and tentacles moving together. Uh, it all has to be done by a very complex central nervous system. And these are all the things that we know and love about cephalopods today, about squid and octopus. And one of the things that is most fascinating to me about their evolutionary history is that none of these things originally made the first cephalopod. The very first cephalopod was made by a shell, a buoyant shell. And that was what separated the early cephalopods from all of the other snails and mollusks and other clams and things that were living on the seafloor. And to understand how this happened, we have to go way, way, way back in time because cephalopods are twice as old as dinosaurs. So we have to go before humans, obviously, but also way back before the dinosaurs and way back before there was anything on land. So we're now talking 500 million years ago. Land is completely barren except for algae. Are there any phycologists in the audience? You don't even know what phycology is. It's great. It's the study of algae, and I always feel bad saying that there's nothing on land because technically there were some little cells of algae smooshing around here and there. But there was nothing large and interesting. Everything large and interesting was in the ocean. And this is what it looked like. Trilobites, mostly, um, and more algae, but larger algae this time all these big plants here. Um, and almost everything was on the sea floor. So even underwater, there weren't any large animals swimming around. This is way before fish and sharks, no marine reptiles, no marine mammals. And so anything that was swimming was just kind of a little shrimpy thing. And most of the large animals were crawling on or burrowing in or scrabbling around over the sea floor because that was the interesting place where all of the interactions were taking place. And one little fellow who was doing this, along with everybody else, is this little snail-like creature that's thought to be one of the first cephalopods, or the first ancestors of cephalopods. And the shell of this little fellow shows us how they became the wondrous creatures that they turned into. And it happened because this is, this is diagrams, cross-sections of the shell. So here's our little friend still smooching around on the seafloor. But you can see that inside the shell, there are some little chambers. The chambers filled with the yellow color are sectioned off, separated from the rest of the animal, and they're filled with buoyant gas. And once enough of those chambers formed, the gas in them was able to offset the weight of the shell and the weight of the animal and lift it right up into the water column. So that's what you see at the top there is the first real true cephalopod that had a chambered shell with buoyant gas inside the chambers that was able to move around in the water column. And they were some of the first animals to really be swimmers. And not only were they swimmers, but they could get enormous. Because once the shell is no longer heavy, now the shell carries its own buoyancy with it. It can get arbitrarily large. Um, and so cephalopods literally rose above the competition. I like to say this, um, this is a very authentic drawing of the early Ordovician seas, except for the scuba diver who's sort of out of place, but she's just there to show scale, to show you how incredibly large these animals got. The straight-shelled cephalopods are going off of the screen. They were large enough that the shells would have reached the entire length of this room. And then we don't even know if they had tentacles, how many tentacles they had, how long those tentacles might have been. So they really were some of the first sea monsters, the first sea monsters in the whole ocean, which meant in the whole world, because there was still nothing large on land. And so on top here, again, with a, a, this time with a snappily dressed man for scale, um, we have Camaraceras, one of those really long shelled, straight shelled early cephalopods. Um, and then this curled shelled cephalopod down here is a type of cephalopod called an ammonite that lived much later. Um, that one actually lived in the oceans at the same time as dinosaurs were living on land. Ichthyosaurs were swimming around. If they were big enough, they were probably trying to eat these guys. Mosasaurs were probably eating them. Um, and you can see that the shells got large enough that a person could climb inside of that shell. They were really tremendous throughout the hundreds of millions of years that they lived in the ocean. And for most of this time, they all had these big shells that carried their own buoyancy around with them. And so they were, they were sort of freed up to move wherever they wanted, to be as large as they 
could possibly evolve to be. And they were living there, doing all of this at the same time, both long before and also at the same time as the dinosaurs were doing all of their crazy things on land. And then what really blows my mind is that they faced extinction at the same time. At the end of the Cretaceous, when an asteroid smashed into the planet and all of the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, so did most of the cephalopods. It was a very bad day. They don't know exactly what happened. Um, we do know that the asteroid hit, that it changed the global climate. It probably acidified the surface areas of the oceans tremendously. Um, there were probably lots of fires all over the place. It's still a matter of active research why this really bad day caused such specific extinctions. Because you remember, not everything went extinct. It was not a really bad day for everybody. We still have all of our birds, all of our avian dinosaurs, and we still have all of our squid and octopus and nautilus and cuttlefish that we talked about. Uh, and so this is a very interesting question about why some of these animals survived one of the worst days on the planet, and so many others went extinct. And it makes it very interesting to study both of these large, famous groups that faced extinction, the dinosaurs and the cephalopods. Now I have to wonder, so cephalopods were huge ancient monsters. They lived before the dinosaurs and through the time of the dinosaurs, and they had a horrible, massive murder mystery extinction at the same time. So why aren't they as cool? Why don't we know as much? I mean, they are as cool, but why don't we think they're as cool? Why don't we know as much about them? Um, and the interesting thing is the sort of fossils they leave are extremely different from the sort of fossils that dinosaur leaves. A dinosaur leaves, interestingly, cephalopod fossils are actually way more abundant. So this is just a picture here of a single rock that's crammed with these coiled ammonites. These are ancient cephalopods. Um, that, that lived at around the same time as the dinosaurs with these coiled shells. And they're just, they're fossilized everywhere. This is you know, a single dinosaur thigh bone, which is always a very exciting find, to find even one bone from a dinosaur skeleton. And you would think that if their fossils are more abundant, we would know more about them. But the abundance of their fossils caused an interesting situation for many, many years, which is their fossils are so abundant that geologists just used them as timestamps. This is a picture of sort of a, a cross-section through rocks, showing you how rocks get deposited in layers, and then they, the layers get eroded. So if you go out digging for fossils in different places, you might dig through different layers and find different fossils. And in this case, these fossils are showing you that even if you dig in very different places in the world, you might find the same fossils from place to place, and that can help you know the age of the rocks that you're digging in. And those fossils that are reliable enough to tell you the age of the rocks you're digging in, those are called index fossils. And many, many index fossils are cephalopods, are ammonites and the relatives of squid, because they're so abundant, they're so diverse, and they're so easily recognized. A single shell uh, can be identified to species quite easily by counting the ribs and figuring out um, various, uh, just taking morphometrics, basically doing little measurements and saying it's wider than it is tall, or it's fatter than it is tall, and all of these things will give you the species. And so for a long time, geologists were like, these are super useful rocks. They're the most useful rocks in the world, but they're not animals. Nobody was thinking about what were these things doing when they were alive. Ecologically speaking, why did they evolve these crazy shapes and these intricate lines? And some of them were spiky, and some of them were tiny, and some of them were big. And nobody really thought about those questions because they were just so useful as timestamps. And then, this book was published in 2001 called Ammonites. And it's a really little book. It was published um, by a couple of people at the Natural History Museum. Um, in London, and they just asked a very simple question. What might these ammonites, these ancient cephalopods, have looked like when they were alive? And more importantly, what were they doing? What were they eating? And who was eating them? And this was kind of a first step towards creating dioramas like fourth graders everywhere do with dinosaurs, and you have the T-Rex jumping on the triceratops and taking large bites out of it. Um, and after this book was published, people started publishing illustrations like this in their scientific papers, actually trying to recreate the animals and think what would they have been doing. This particular animal up here is a kind of, um, a kind of ammonite that grows a recurved shell, sort of like a paperclip. 
And it's been puzzling scientists for a really long time, thinking, what did they do? Why would they bend their shell back again? It seems like it would be really awkward for swimming. And then um, this, this crazy Russian scientist named Sasha Kipkin was like, well, maybe they just used it like a paper clip. If it's shaped like a paper clip, maybe it works like a paper clip. And why didn't they just hook themselves on to some kelp or some underwater driftwood um, and live there, live a very sedentary life? Um, and, you know, then, and so he drew this picture, and that got published. And, and then other scientists published angry diatribes showing why that couldn't possibly be the case. And it was great, because science has been proceeding by leaps and bounds, because people are actually thinking, talking about it, building models to see what can happen. Um, and so the other thing that is helping to move this forward is not just the shift in perspective, that people are finally thinking about what they would have looked like, what the cephalopod dioramas of the deep sea should look like. But there are new ways to look at the fossils. So technology has proceeded to the point where we can get more information out of those old fossils. And all of these fossils that I showed you are all well and good. They're beautiful. It's easy to count ribs and things like that. But it doesn't tell you very much about what the animal was like. If you look at an articulated skeleton of a T. rex or a brontosaurus, you can drape flesh onto it pretty easily. You see where the neck was. You see how many legs it had. You see how long its tail was. But all of the soft parts of a cephalopod are totally missing from this kind of fossil. They're just gone. And we have no idea where their mouth was or what number of tentacles they might have had. But now, um, paleontologists are making friends with medical imagery technicians, and putting rocks into CT scanners, which I'm told is like everybody's favorite thing when they go to the hospital and find that there are fossils being run through the, the CT scanner and everybody gathers around to see what's going on. Uh, because the great thing is if you look inside these kinds of fossils, you can actually start to get information about the soft parts that's missing. Um, and in this case, uh, this particular fossil was a straight-shelled cephalopod. Um, and the CT scanner is not yet finding how many tentacles it had, but it is finding the mouth. And there's some pretty stunning images coming out. This is straight out of a paper in science, which is like science papers are incredibly condensed. So I'm sorry to show you this image that's like, ah, oh, too much information. But uh, basically, A on top, that's a picture of the straight shell that was put in the CT scanner. Um, B shows you a, a sort of cross-sectional view of what sort of the beginning of the mouth might have looked like inside that shell. And then these shapes here that you're seeing are the tongue of the animal. Cephalopods, squid, and octopus, and all of their cousins have these really complex tongues with a lot of teeth on them called radula. And these tongues of these ancient cephalopods seem to have been really, really complex. They were these sort of folded up origami shapes with little tongues all over them that look like they could have been unfolded and used almost like a spider's web to catch plankton, to catch little particles and little animals and things in the open ocean. So this tells us all, and this, this here is um, sort of a, a 3D reconstruction of how that might have, this uh, colorful part up there is the radula, that tongue being unfolded slowly from kind of a base, a uh, jaw base where it would have sat inside the animal. Uh, and so this is really abstract for most of us to look at, but fortunately there are artists who work with scientists to then make reconstructions like this, uh, which doesn't show you the radula, unfortunately, but it is showing you this beak out of which the radula would have unfolded. And the whole structure of the animal is based around that knowledge of it being something that eats plankton. A lot of other reconstructions think of these ancient animals as being active predators, carnivores like squid and octopus are today. But this discovery of that complicated radula that would have just filtered plankton out of the water has helped a new interpretation arise, thinking like, OK, they didn't have really long arms that were muscular for grabbing food. They just had this little web of arms, maybe. And then this beak that could open up and <laughs> sort of slurp up all of the little yummy bits and pieces. And they probably, this prone at least, would not have been a very good swimmer. It would have just sort of gently drifted here and there, picking up food, which is a different thing that none of the living cephalopods do. There aren't really any plankton-feeding squid or octopuses. They tend to be mostly active predators. And so in a way, it's sort of like 
looking at ancient dinosaurs and being like, well, we don't really have any T. rexes anymore, but if you can imagine a chicken getting that big and being carnivorous, and what would it be like? Um, and so this, this sort of uh, nuanced ability to interpret the fossils is really growing, um, creating what seems to me to be a wonderful time for a cephalopod renaissance, for the extinct cephalopods. Um, and these are more artist reconstructions that are a little bit more fantastical. Uh, but again, like dinosaurs, we don't really have any idea what color they were. So paleo artists can just kind of go wild with it. Um, and all of these shapes are completely realistic. There are ancient cephalopod fossils that grew in corkscrews with spikes that had these weird recurve. This is sort of a cousin of the paperclip one over here that just were super irregular knots. Um, and we're still trying to figure out why they had all these super weird shapes. And while paleontologists are working on this to figure out what was going on, it's kind of a perfect time for the public to become excited about cephalopods because all of our modern cephalopods, squid and octopus, around us today are going through boom times. There's what's been referred to as a global proliferation of cephalopods. And these figures here are from a paper that was published in 2016 that was kind of a review paper, gathering data from fisheries and from scientific surveys, from uh, octopuses, cuttlefish, squid, ones that live close to the shore and ones that live further out and in the deep, and showing that all of them, averaged together, are trending up. And we are living in a very, um, we're very bullish on cephalopods in the oceans these days. And the reason seems to be that all of these animals have evolved away from that heavy shell. They don't have a big external shell anymore. And it's created an extremely flexible group of animals because they can grow quickly, they don't have to build a heavy shell, um, they have a lot of babies that can adapt very quickly to their changing environment. And that adaptability and flexibility seems to be a lot of what's driving this boom. That and the fact that humans have been fishing a lot of their main predators out of the ocean. And so they're, they're sort of a, like, thanks for removing all of the fish and now we will go wild situation. Uh, and of course, there are t-shirts that you can buy celebrating this uh, dominance of the cephalopods. Uh, I forgot to wore, wear mine today, but you can look them up online. However, there are uh, always some exceptions to this sort of optimistic view of the cephalopod future. And I have to mention that there are a few species that are not doing especially well that are actually listed as endangered, and they are deep sea octopuses that live in the deep cold waters where they take a very long time to grow and they reproduce only a few eggs. And worst of all, they happen to have neighbors that are very delicious. So even though you've probably never heard of these octopuses, they don't have common names because nobody talks about them commonly, um, but they live on sea mounts in the deep sea where orange roughy fish and scampi shrimp also live. And people like to eat those things. And when people throw down nets into the deep sea to get the shrimp and the fish, they also catch these octopuses. And that's why these particular species are considered endangered, is because many of them have been accidentally brought up in these nets and that populations are suffering. Um, and even the squid that are booming throughout the oceans and doing really well have some risks. Um, these are a couple of papers that came out showing that there are problems with ocean acidification affecting the early development of squid. So even though right now they seem to be doing really well, the oceans are changing, they're getting warmer and warmer, and the water is getting more and more acidic, and those things might in the near future cause that boom trajectory to flatten out or even get depressed a little bit, depending on how things change, how much we decide to change things or not let them go on as normal. And then, of course, we still have one cephalopod with an external shell, nautilus. So how are they doing? Well, I think of nautiluses as sort of a, a cautionary tale because they're so beautiful. They still have that external shell. They're the last cephalopod with an external shell. Um, and they have these beautiful tiger stripes. And you can buy them anywhere, uh, it turns out. They're not even very expensive. Um, which is a problem because if you can buy them anywhere, then people will pull them out of the ocean more and more to make money. 
and then there won't be any Nautiluses anymore. And this has become enough of a problem that in 2017, uh, CITES, the, which is the international treaty that regulates all the big endangered species like rhinoceros horn and elephant tusks, has decided to start regulating the trade in nautilus shells as well, um, which is very encouraging. And uh, it's being considered for being listed on the Endangered Species Act here in the US, which would also cause more protections to be put in place so fewer of them could be imported. And um, and it would hopefully lead to a longer survival time for this lineage of shelled cephalopods, the last ones with that buoyant shell. Um, and this listing, or this, this possibility of listing cephalopods here, is open for public comment. And, um, and I went and read all of the public comments that people had posted, and one of them in particular struck me. So I thought I would, I would bring it to you. This is a, a neuroethologist named Heike Neumeister. So neuroethologist means she studies brain and behavior and how those things are connected. And she commented that Nautilus represents a window to the past, a unique opportunity to understand the evolution of the brain, including its vulnerability. Its protection is not only important for us, but indeed is a moral imperative for mankind. So she was of the opinion that she was presenting this idea that because we have Nautiluses still around today, and because their history goes back 500 million years before the dinosaurs, they are really the, a one-of-a-kind opportunity to understand how this incredible brain that we see in octopus and squid, how it evolved in contrast to other members of the species. Um, and so I think this is a really beautiful way to connect the study of the ancient cephalopods and my, my mission to get everybody to find them to be just as cool as dinosaurs with what's going on currently with the living cephalopods that we have here today. It's a really deep lineage here. This is um, the history going all the way back to the Cambrian 500 million years ago. Here's our, our old buddy with the very first little chambers in its shell, all the way through the really long straight shelled ones. This is not exactly to scale because I didn't have just sort of infinite room to go off here. Uh, and, the, and then the early coiled cephalopods, all these super weird shapes of ammonoids that proliferated and then went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. And you'll see over here that the Nautilus has been just chugging along from its ancestors all the way back here towards really the root of the tree. And it's still a lot of open questions, a lot of mystery. Why do they, have they changed in a way that we can't tell from the fossils? Are they really these unchanged living fossils? There's a lot of, uh, of interesting work to be done there. And meanwhile, all of the other cephalopods, the octopuses, the squid, the cuttlefish, are doing all of their own things, a beautiful proliferation that we're seeing in the oceans today. And by comparing all of this stuff, all of the deep time history with all of the modern diversity, um, we're really in a, in a beautiful place to understand this group like never before. And it's a group that is uniquely suited to sort of shedding light on all of life on Earth because it's really the farthest group from us primates that has developed intelligence and curiosity and problem solving skills. And by comparing the way we do those things with the way cephalopods do those things, we can really get a, a holistic understanding. So I just wanted to thank you all finally for coming and take some questions. Hi, uh, or thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, I had a question. How hard would it be to um, breed and farm Nautilus? Ah, the, the, breed, the question is how hard would it be to breed Nautilus? Yes, because the, you're saying that the shells are so beautiful mm -hmm. and people start importing them and so we want to put them on the endangered list. As I think, I'm thinking as an alternative, we could like maybe start farming them for the shells. Yeah. And Aquaculture is often seen as a, as a solution if we want more of something, but the, the wild uh, harvest isn't available, can we make them ourselves? Nautilus are really interesting group in that regard, an interesting species, because they've only just successfully been bred at all. Like, 
if, although people have been keeping the animals in aquariums for a long time, they haven't been successfully breeding and laying eggs. And just in the last year or two at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, they've been keeping them and they've actually laid the eggs and the eggs have actually hatched, which are two separate challenges <laughs> that both had to be overcome. Um, but there's still a huge gap in having hatchlings and having those grow up to be breeding adults. So I think it's possible. Um, and I, I hope that it happens because for many reasons. One is that I think it would just be very interesting. But it's, uh, it seems like they're a very finicky species and they're just very specific about the water requirements and the food requirements. And so I believe right now the, aquari the aquarists at the Monterey Bay Aquarium are trying to figure out what to feed the babies to get them to grow up healthy. And it's, it takes a long time because even with good conditions, it takes them up to 20 years to reach maturity. So that's, you know, that's getting to be several aquarists' lifetimes of practice. Um, but uh, but I, think, I think it will get there. I think it will be very cool. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, um, you said these creatures are found in deep sea, right? Many of them. Yeah, so not all, but many. Deep meaning how deep? Like, and how have they adapted to, because there's a lot of water pressure, right? Like, if it is deep. Yeah. Can you talk something about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Are, are you more interested in the, the living ones or the extinct ones or both? All of them. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's a great question. The, um, the forms that have buoyant shells are, of course, always somewhat limited because they have gas in their shell. And so if they go too deep, that can ex implode. Uh, so even modern nautiluses and modern cuttlefish which have an internal shell that still has gas chambers in it, are limited by depth. So cuttlefish, because their, sh their internal shell has quite weak walls, they can't go much deeper than one or maybe 200 feet. Uh, they're quite shallow because of that. Well, shallow for an open ocean animal, not for us. Uh, Nautilus can go a little bit deeper. They can get to about 800 feet for, the m for most ones. And that's, that's because the shell is much, much thicker. Uh, and the, the limits of the extinct ones are, of course, hard to calculate. And it's always a little bit tricky to know where they lived because the shells sometimes move around before being fossilized. And so if, they're f if the fossilized shells are found in sediment that it shows that it was in the deep sea. Well, does it mean that the animal lived in the deep sea or does it mean the animal lived above the deep sea? Um, but they, they're thought, many of them, especially, let me see if I can go back here. Um, this is an interesting, where are my ammonites? There. Um, these guys, uh, in particular, many of these ammonites had, sorry, I probably wasn't supposed to touch that. Um, uh, had these really complicated walls between the chambers. So all of the squiggles that you see here are like if each chamber, chamber's wall between was made of sort of tissue paper and you just scrambled it up. And it's still sealed between the chambers and held the gas from place to place, but it had this incredibly complex uh, line. And it's thought that that might have sort of somehow spread out the pressure and allowed them to go even deeper. Um, and so there, there's some paleontologists actually working right now on kind of reconstructing these as models and figuring out what pressure they might have been, been able to survive at. So do you know, like, what's the maximum that it penetrated? Um, I don't think, let's see, I don't think any of them have been estimated to live deeper than about 1,000 feet. So I don't think any of the shelled cephalopods could have lived in what we think of as the real abyssal deep sea. Um, what this, the first cephalopods to colonize that area would have been the ones that lost the shell. And in fact, it's thought that the ancestors of squid, who had evolved away from having uh, an external shell, and even, even their internal shell doesn't have gas chambers anymore, it's just like this sort of thin, stiff rod that gives them a little bit of structure. So they are basically insensitive to pressure because they're incompressible. They're just, there's no gas spaces, there's no gas bladder, there's nothing. And so it's thought that one of the reasons they might have survived the end Cretaceous impact is that they had a refuge in the deep sea where things didn't change so much. And there, there are still many squid living in the very deep sea today. Uh, 
Yeah, Mimic. Speak, speaking of squid, um, I'm an octopus person, but I also love the Humboldt squid. Uh, I was wondering what drew you to that for your um, PhD, and can you talk a little bit about that? I would be happy to. It's a lovely question. So uh, the Humboldt squid um, was the subject of my PhD, and it was somewhat accidental because I went into looking for graduate programs and, and PhD advisors just being kind of a huge cephalopod nut. And I was like, I'll work on anything. Like, are you doing bobtail squid? Are you doing pygmy octopuses? Whatever it is. Um, and in Monterey, there's a marine station that is affiliated with Stanford University. Some of you may already know this. It's right next to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and it's called Hopkins Marine Station. Um, and there's a squid lab there. And the, the scientist who runs that lab, Bill Gilley, was starting up a whole research program on Humboldt squid at about the same time that I was applying to graduate school. And so, um, so I met with him, and we, he talked to me a bit about the squid. And it's like, I have never heard of these guys before, but they sound really cool. And it was also, um, they were just starting to expand their range. So it was a really interesting time to be working on them. That it was a lar it's a large species. It still is a very large species. The adults can get about as big as me. And it's also the biggest squid fishery in the whole world. So of all of the different species of squid that people eat, little calamari, um, these big squid steaks that are on Humboldt squid, are it's fished by the million tons a year. And most of that is in South America, Central America, and Mexico. But in the early 2000s, we were starting to find them on the California coast and even up into Alaska. They were getting really far north. And so it was a really fun time to be a scientist studying them because we would get calls from people just like, as fishermen, we, we caught a huge squid. Is it a giant squid? What is it? Why are, can you eat it? Can I sell it? What can I do with it? Uh, and so, um, so it, was, it was just it was a really neat time. And we were trying to figure out why they were there, what they were doing. I ended up working a lot with the babies on reproduction. And my main question there was thinking, OK, we know that there are adults coming up north into California, which is very cold water for them. They're used to the, the warmer water in the Gulf of California. So OK, can they have babies up here? Like basically, are we going to get a reproducing population establishing itself as their range is expanding? Um, and it's and interestingly, at the same time as I was figuring out that the little babies needed warm water, and they were actually very finicky. They're teeny. This is a hilarious thing. So you have a grown up as big as me, and when their babies hatch, they're like a grain of rice. And they're quite finicky, and they need warm water, and they need very special food. And it's, it's kind of the Nautilus problem even. We couldn't feed them anything. We would give them everything we would think of, and they would just starve in the lab. And go, all right, go back to the ocean, find whatever you were meant to find. Um, and, and it seems interesting that while I was finding that they had this very particular need as babies, the invasion, as everyone was calling it, of California just kind of slowed down. And eventually, um, now fishermen off California and further north hardly ever find Humboldt squid. They're pretty much all retreated back to their native range in Mexico. And even there, they've gotten a lot smaller. So it's, it's, it's been fun to see in practice the sort of flexibility that I talked about. Because the species as a whole is still doing really well. But you can see them responding year by year and even season by season to the way the ocean changes. That's very cool. Hi. Thanks Hi. for the awesome talk. So this is a strange question, but given the absence of preserved soft body features, how do we know that extinct cephalopods even had tentacles? It's a great question. Um, how do we even know that they had tentacles? Uh, I'm going to go to uh, the short answer is we don't. Maybe they didn't have tentacles at all. And in particular, sorry, these guys, um, these really early ones, I mean, I think that in a way, the only reason people draw them with tentacles is to show that we know they're cephalopods because that's the defining feature. Um, but they might not have had tentacles at all. Interestingly, by this point here, which is the, the branching point where you get the lineage of the nautiluses and then the lineage going to all your modern cephalopods, we're pretty sure that they would have had tentacles by then because tentacles, the f and the tentacles come from the foot. So the, the ancestral cephalopod was related to a snail, which has a big foot that it oozes around on. And so we know, because of studying the way they develop in the egg, that what happens is that foot splits into tentacles quite early on in development. And that happens in embryonic nautilus and in embryonic squid at the same time and with the same number. So it's always 10 to begin with, even with a nautilus that eventually gets up to 60 or 90 tentacles. And because that trait seems to be so conserved, 
it's, it's thought that it probably goes way back to this split, that there's an ancestral cephalopod trait of having a foot that divides into 10 tentacles. And then that evolved in nautiluses at some point to be just this like plethora of tentacles. And in squid, two of those, those and they were all equal, equal length as well, because you do get a few fossils up over here that have these 10 equal length tentacles. And so two of them in squid became much longer and elastic. Two of them in octopuses disappeared. But even in octopuses, we know that the ancestral characteristic was to have 10. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of the answers. We're pretty sure that by here they had tentacles, and some point in here it probably evolved. It would have been useful if you think about being a snail up in the water. How do you get your food? But maybe you just have a really flexible foot. <laughs> an interesting question. Um, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, question about chromatophores and when they evolved, and if there is a way to tell when they evolved. And then a second part of the question, the radula, is that just a mollusk trait? And that's how they know that that's what the tongue looked like when they were going back and creating imagery, or how do they tell? Right. So two different traits, the chromatophores, the color changing ability, and the, the radula. Um, so I'll take the radula first, since there's more physical evidence for it. Uh, the radula is a molluscan trait. So you'll see radulas in snails, even in clams. Um, all kinds of different mollusks. And in fact, all of the different snail radulas are useful because sna snails eat in a lot of different ways. And I don't mean just um, garden snails at this point. There are a lot of marine snails, and there are marine snails that uh, scrape food off rocks, and there are marine snails that are predators that eat other fish, and there are marine snails that float, actually float through the water and catch plankton. And so looking at all of those different radulas is the main way that the paleontologists who've begun to look at ammonite radulas, cephalopod radulas, kind of say, okay, what would it have been good for? Does it look more like the snail that eats plankton or the snail that eats algae or these things? And so the, um, the radula itself is usually not preserved independently as a fossil because it's quite delicate and it probably just falls apart. And so I th if I am remembering right, the only real radulas that are found are when they're inside uh, a shell. And so either the shell has to be physically broken, and then it's, it's sort of just luck whether you actually find the radula or whether you've destroyed it by breaking the shell, or you see it by doing an essentially like an electronic dissection with a CT scan. Um, and then for the chromatophore, is, that's a very good question. We think that probably that amazing skin, that amazing color-changing skin, evolved around the same time that the shell, 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 went internal which is in this lineage called the coleoids. I, and um, th this is one of these fun facts that I only learned when I started researching my book. I, a PhD did not teach me this, but um, when you're doing all this etymological research because people ask you questions, coleoid means scabbard. So this whole group is named because their bodies became like the scabbards for their shell. It was internalized and covered up. Uh, and so once the shell goes internal, which is this little light colored thing, it's still chambered, it's still buoyant, it was still quite substantial for a long time, but it was no longer something you could hide in. And so at that point, it would have been extremely advantageous for the skin to develop some method of protection. And so we think that that's probably when both camouflage and ink sacs are likely to have evolved. But there's, there's precious little in the fossil record about either one. So uh, putting on my, my three third grader hat here, do we call them tentacles because there are 10 of them? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, it, is, uh, it is technically wrong to call them all <laughs> tentacles. <laughs> so I'm trying to find a gentler word for the third grader. It's, it's wrong. Um, they're all arms, really. And the word tentacles is best to reserve for those two really elastic ones. Uh, so a squid or a cuttlefish, if you've ever maybe seen a video of them catching prey, or you can go home and look one up, um, they have their arms that are just always the same length, and maybe they might grab slow-moving prey with it. But if they need to catch a fish or something that's really fast, they have these elastic tentacles that go, shoom, and catch it and bring it back in. It's like milliseconds. It's really, really fast. And those are the tentacles. So squid have them, cuttlefish have them, octopuses do not have them. Um, so t technically, squid and cuttlefish are the only ones with true tentacles. And, but you can remember them, not because of the ten part, but because the word tentacle is longer than the word arm. And tentacles are longer than arms. <laughs> I have 
one more if it's okay. Um, so since the seas are acidifying, I had a question about the shells because you're saying the, the bitty squids and octopuses are having a problem. Are they a calcium carbonate shell or are they silica based? They're calcium carbonate. Okay. Um, all the, even the cuddle bone, which is the internal shell. Um, and the squid, mo for the most part, is not even calcified. So that's one of the reasons that squids seem to be a bit more resilient to ocean acidification is they don't have very much that's actually calcified. Uh, but the nautilus shell and the cuttlefish shell are, are calcium. Interestingly, there is one other place that all of the cephalopods have a bit of calcium carbonate that's very sensitive to acidification, and it's these little bones in their ears, teeny little bones called statoliths, that help them tell up from down. We actually have similar little teeny tiny bones in our ears that rock around, and they're what make you sick on merry-go-rounds and how you know when you're facing up and when you're pointed down. And the development of those teeny little bones in cephalopods seems to be quite affected by acidified waters. And so there's some risk that we might end up with oceans full of sort of d disoriented, lost squid that can't figure out which way is up and down. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, though, so fingers crossed. <laughs> well, thank you, Dana. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Let's give one more round of applause.